This 6th of August was the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. One incandescent moment demonstrating the overwhelming advantage that the US held over every other nation. And its willingness to deploy it. As the second sun rose over Hiroshima, it seemed for all the world that the Great War was effectively over. Why then did the US also choose to bomb Nagasaki? Let's try to answer why Harry Truman, the president of the US at the time, decided to massacre innocents by the thousands to prove a point that it seemed he had already made. The US Air Force had begun a concerted campaign of firebombing major Japanese cities since March of 1945. In the first and biggest such attacks, 346 B-29s took to the skies and dropped 1,500 tons of explosives on Tokyo, killing over 80,000 people. This was followed by attacks on Nagoya, Osaka and Kobe. The damage was so extensive that when targets for the nuclear strike were being decided, there were only a few key cities that were not already reduced to rubble. These were Kokura, Hiroshima, Yokohama, Niigata and Kyoto. Kyoto was considered a particularly good target because being the cultural center, the target committee believed that destroying it would make the greatest psychological impact on the Japanese people. However, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, vetoed its inclusion. He had visited Kyoto on his honeymoon and did not think it was ethical to target a major cultural center. There were voices in the military that tried to put it back on the list. But in late July, it was ultimately replaced by the port of Nagasaki. 63 million pamphlets rained down on the Japanese people during the weeks of bombardment. The Lame pamphlets read as follows. Read this carefully as it may save your life or the life of a relative or friend. In the next few days, some or all of the cities named on the reverse side will be destroyed by American bombs. Some see these pamphlets as proof that the US was committed to sparing civilian lives. Critics, on the other hand, say that while cities were mentioned, they did not say when they would be bombed. To which the obvious reply is, duh, why would you tell your enemy when and where your bombers would arrive? The one criticism that is probably not too far off the mark is that they were a form of psychological warfare on the Japanese populace. And to this end, they succeeded. Wartime production stalled as people fled from the cities. The Japanese government, recognizing this, made possession of these pamphlets an arrestable offense. And psychological warfare or not, the US made good on its promise, hitting most of the cities on the list. In the early hours of August 9th, the boxcar, a B-29 carrying on board it, the Fat Man, suffered a technical issue. Due to the failure of a fuel transfer pump, it would not be able to access the reserve fuel in its tail. The mission had been moved two days earlier from 11th to 9th because of weather conditions. So delaying it might mean scrapping it altogether. And the bomb, being a complex, fully understood piece of technology, could not be safely moved to another aircraft. Charles Sweeney, the pilot, and Paul Tibbetts, his commander, as well as the pilot on the Hiroshima mission, had a decision to make. They finally agreed to proceed as planned, but Sweeney was instructed not to wait beyond 15 minutes to rendezvous with the support aircrafts that were coming along for photography and observation. The mission started smoothly enough, with the reconnaissance planes reporting clear skies over the target. But soon, things took a turn for the worse. One of the support aircrafts failed to make the rendezvous because they were flying too high and in the wrong pattern. This would not have been a problem in itself. But Sweeney decided to wait for them, even though he had been expressly told not to. By the time he gave up and departed, he was 30 minutes behind schedule. This too may not have been catastrophic, but in those 30 minutes, morning fog came rolling in over Kokura and winds carried in smoke from bomb cities nearby. And having seen the fate of the neighboring cities, the steel workers of Kokura began burning coal tar to further obscure the sky. After three attempts, fuel was running low. And while at 30,000 feet, anti-aircraft guns would find them a difficult target, Japanese planes were already in the air to intercept them. Charles Sweeney was forced to abandon the attempt and proceed to the secondary target, Nagasaki. 
Unfortunately, when they got there, that also turned out to be covered by clouds. They could have used radar for targeting, but they had received instructions to confirm the target visually. This was a difficult situation since they did not have enough fuel to fly back to the base. While there were alternate bases for them to land in, with fuel as low as it was, they could not risk crashing the plane and detonating the device. Either they could drop the bomb on Nagasaki without visual confirmation or jettison it over the ocean. Now the next bit is pure speculation, but here it is anyway. Alex Wellerstein, creator of the popular website NukeMap and famous historian, points out that it was the bombardier Kermit Behan's birthday. And does anyone want to be the guy who dumped a perfectly good nuke into the ocean on his birthday? He'd never live it down. Whatever the motivations, they claim that the clouds cleared for a moment and Bian was able to catch a glimpse of a stadium. The fat man was dropped and detonated over Nagasaki. Bihan and Sweeney had etched their names in the history books. Alex Wellerstein says that while Truman had authorized the use of nuclear weapons, the second bomb had shocked him. Truman had given blanket authorization for the use of nuclear weapons, but didn't give this particular order. Following this, policy would soon change to require presidential authorization for every nuclear strike. A comforting thought, I think. But it was too late for the residents of Nagasaki, whose traditional houses, made of combustible materials, were soon engulfed in the rabid nuclear fire. Truman may not have been personally responsible for this, but why did the military chain of command decide to deploy a second weapon at all? 1. After the first bomb was dropped, Japanese nuclear scientists went to Hiroshima. They confirmed that the damage could not have been from conventional explosives and bore all the marks of an atomic weapon. But Japan's chief of naval staff did not believe that US was capable of making more than one or two. And he said as much to the cabinet. By this time, the US had learned to intercept their communication. From the communications, it was clear that the Japanese cabinet believed that they could ride out America's remaining arsenal of nuclear weapons and draw them into a long and damaging war of attrition. Two, kamikaze, where they would crash their planes in ships and bombers in order to take them down. They even began manufacturing cheap planes that could take off but not land for these suicide attacks. The unprecedented nature of the strategy and utter disregard for life likely convinced a lot of decision makers that Japan would fight till the bitter end. 3. To reach the home islands and force a surrender, the US would have had to invade Kyushu. Estimates put the cost of such an invasion at 45,000 deaths, and this was before Japan committed an even greater force to protect it. After the heavy losses incurred in taking Okinawa and Iwo Jima, the Americans knew that there could be hundreds of thousands of casualties. And no country puts the lives of an enemy civilians over the lives of their own soldiers. After the bombing of Hiroshima, a new set of pamphlets floated down from America's B-29s. They read, We are in possession of the most destructive explosive ever devised by man. We have just begun to use this weapon against your homeland. If you still have any doubt, make inquiry as to what happened to Hiroshima when just one atomic bomb fell on that city. Come to think of it, this may have even influenced Shonen, where the fighters always, and I mean always, warn their opponents about how they're going to attack in excruciating detail. But I'd question the veracity of this warning. There were 72 hours in between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They made and dropped pamphlets in how many cities in those 72 hours. And in case you're thinking that they were already ready to go in anticipation of Hiroshima's bombing, they also include a reference of the Soviet Union's declaration of war, which happened the previous day on the 8th of August at 11 p.m. You can come up with plenty of scenarios, but the evidence seems to point at either a botched warning or a cynical face-saving measure. The explosion over Nagasaki was 20 kilotons. This explosion in Beirut was around one kiloton.
Emperor Hirohito unconditionally surrendered on August 15th, though militant factions within the government did try to stop the broadcast from going out. Perhaps giving some credence to the notion that Japan would not have surrendered without an overwhelming demonstration of ruthlessness. Some may even say cruelty. Sweeney limped back to Okinawa with both the engines of his B-29 failing due to lack of fuel. On his return, Colonel Tibet had to decide if any action should be taken against the airplane commander Charles Sweeney for the failure to command. But ultimately, it was decided by the higher-ups that an investigation into Sweeney's conduct would serve no useful purpose. But all said and done, the purpose of the mission was to drop a nuke on a Japanese city. I'd argue that Sweeney's decisions, although monumental, did not reflect on his morality. There's a different lesson to be learned here. In some ways, the mission flown by Charles Sweeney was an allegory on war itself. Chaos, fog, pride, all wrapped up in the bias towards action. Maybe these explain the second bomb better than any retrospective analysis of the motives of all the actors involved. We'd all like to believe that we'd do the right thing if we ever find ourselves at the crossroads of history. But who's to say? And while I do not condone the bombing of Nagasaki, I can understand how good, reasonable, and intelligent people might have still gone through with it. In 1995, having had 50 years to consider his role in history, Sweeney said, There's no question in my mind that President Truman made the right decision. As the man who commanded the last atomic mission, I pray that I retain that singular distinction. And I think that's a good way to think about this. Let's not remember Nagasaki as the site of the second nuclear detonation, but the last. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe, and share your thoughts below to get more videos like this in your recommendation. I'll see you really soon. Bye.